Uh, so we have four great speakers today. It's like really amazing to have Evelina, to have Eric Brewer, to have uh, Katie McCaffrey, to have Ines Sombra here today. It's like awesome. I can't imagine how awesome it is. And it's happening, right? Um, so I want to bring up uh, Evelina Gabashova first. A uh, researcher working in bioinformatics at the, uh, at the University of Cambridge, um, talking about the AlphaGo paper from Nature. It's super exciting. Um, yes, uh, one last thing. Uh, if you have a question, we have three people running around with mics. Uh, I'll be on this side, Darren on this side, and uh, David will be up front. Um, you know, hopefully the speakers will repeat questions that they can. If we can't get to you, but we'll try, try to get to you. Wait for us, we'll run to you. Cool. Thank you, Evelina. Okay. Thanks for the intro. Yes. So, well, let's talk about the most exciting thing that happened in AI this year, probably. And that's AlphaGo, the program playing Go. And this is actually a picture from a tournament with the European champion, Fan Hui. And you can see that he's pretty miserable because he is losing. <laughs> so I will try to give you some like, bit more insight into how this actually worked and how they did it. So to give you like, a bit of background, uh, well, the top pictures are from chess. And Human masters were basically defeated by machine back in, in 1997. This is Gary Kasparov against Deep Blue. And this looks ancient now. And it took us almost 20 years to get better at Go and to actually beat the world master uh, Lee, uh, Lee Sedol in the bottom picture. So how did we get there and why did it take such a long time? Well, if we look at chess, it's actually a relatively small game. On average, if you are having some board position, there are roughly 20 moves you can make. And an average game of chess takes about 40 moves. So that's 20 to the power of 40 possible positions on average. Well, Go is much larger, much larger. <laughs> so. From average position, you have about 200 possible moves that you can make. And a game is also much longer. It takes roughly 150 moves to finish a game, which means it's 200 to the power of 150, which is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So how can we actually search such a game? Well, traditionally, games were computationally played using tree search. This is an example of tic-tac-toe, which is probably the smallest game you can play with this algorithm. And you start with an empty board, and then you model each possible move that you can make. And that's an action, and you get some position in a game. So this is one player playing, then you get another edge with the opponent playing, etc., and you model the entire tree. And then, once you have the entire tree, you can look at the outcome, who won, who, did, who lost from each branch, and back propagate the information through the tree back up, and then basically follow just the optimal policy for each move. That's fairly uh, straightforward, fairly easy, and there are developed some like, quite nice algorithms how to do this more efficiently, like not to explore some branches that are not very promising, like alpha-beta pruning, which you might have heard about. But you can probably guess that this is not really feasible for Go. Try to model something as big as Go using this type of approach. Well, there are other approaches as well, quite similar. And the one used in AlphaGo is called Monte Carlo Tree Search. And this algorithm was actually introduced back in 1987, so it's nothing new. And, well, you can, for example, reach superhuman uh, performance in Scrabble using this algorithm. So it's useful in other games as well. And it works, well, you can probably guess from the Monte Carlo prefix, it works by sampling games. And I will have to go a bit more into detail into this algorithm so that you can appreciate what AlphaGo actually does. So this algorithm works again on the tree of the game. And you start from some node in the game. And you select another node underneath it using some rules. Well, we'll see a bit further on how that works. So you select some node in the game, and then you expand it. You look at what moves you can do from that node, 
and then you do a random, uh, then you do a random play from that node on, and record if it went into loss or win for you. So now we have just a random game from some node in the network, and then we backpropagate the information if it was a win or loss back into the root node, and we record basically the information how many times did it lead to win or how many times did it lead to loss. And if you do this sort of simulation enough times, you actually converge to the optimal solution. So this is really nice because you can do it randomly, you don't have to model the entire tree of the game, and also, uh, well, given how much time you have, you can do as many simulations as you want. And the more you do, the more precise you get. So this is a very nice algorithm, and it was used on Go before as well. And it actually, uh, I think it achieved strong amateur strength in Go. So this is pretty cool already. And, well, but for Go, the tree looks a bit more like this. <laughs> so yeah, as I said, it has an average branching factor of 200, and it's very deep as well. So the strategies we need to do to actually solve Go using this type of algorithm is to reduce the width of the tree and reduce the depth of the tree as well. So we can reduce the width by like, cleverly selecting uh, promising moves in the game, and we can reduce the depth by looking at like, values of positions to have some kind of approximation of that. So how do you do that? Well, obviously, the cool algorithm of the moment, deep learning, deep learn everything. So what AlphaGo actually did was they used convolutional neural networks which are pretty standard types of deep neural networks at the moment, which are used typically for image recognition. And they recognize patterns from images. I don't want to go too much into detail, but these are still basically mathematical functions that given some input, they compute an output. And you need to have some supervised data set that you turn them on. And they then can predict uh, output given your input. So it's nothing that magical. And what they did is, well, they took this kind of network that's used normally, like for example, this is a network predicting if an image is a robot or not. So it takes an image of a robot and it says, well, this is a robot with probability 0 0.9. So they took this type of network and changed it into a Go playing network, which took the state of a game and predicted probability of an action. And that's basically one of the core parts of AlphaGo. And they not only used the like, uh, image of the board, they also looked at some like, features of the positions, like who is playing, how many stones are endangered in that position, and things like that. And they actually created two different networks in this style. The first one was trained using a database of expert moves from the KGS Go server. And there you can just go there and look at like, any games of Go played by players of different strengths. So they selected the games played by experts. And they trained one deep neural network using this type of database, and this is the supervised learning network. And then, they used this data that they got from expert moves to train another network, which was training itself by playing against itself. So it got more and more experience. And I think for the original tournament with Fan Hui, the European champion, it, trained some, it played something like 30 million games. So that's not that much, but it's still much more than a human can do, actually. So it learned quite a lot. Now, as I was explaining the Monte Carlo tree search, uh, you also need to somehow do a random traversal of the game tree to get up to the very end. So they also trained another like, simple function that will be fast uh, to approximate something like what the first neural network does. And now we are like, oh, so many networks, like what's going on? Well, they trained another one as well, which was the value network, which also took the state of the game and predicted value of a position. How valuable that position is to, uh, how often will it lead to win in, from there? 
So they're like, ah, oh, so what's going on? Well, so just to summarize what they actually did, they took the database of human moves and they trained first one very fast function that predicted probabilities of uh, moves. And this one, I think it could predict uh, expert moves with probability around 27% compared to the actual neural network, the big one, that could predict it with probability like 57%. So this one was inaccurate, but very fast. Uh, I think they actually mentioned in the paper that th this one could evaluate like the whole game of the tree. I think 1,000 simulations per CPU thread per second. So that's very fast. Then they trained a supervised neural network that could predict probabilities of expert moves much more precisely. And then they used this to create the second neural network that was playing itself and learning from that. And they used this to train the value network. So it's already quite a complex pipeline of trainings. And how does it actually work in the Monte Carlo tree search? Well, the first step was selection. And they actually defined something like a value of an action or of a position on a board that combined the values and combined how many times it led to a win. And well, I will get a bit more into how they updated it a bit later. So they used the neural network trained on the expert moves to expand a node and define a probability distribution over actions that you should do from that position. And then they randomly sampled a game and recorded the outcome. So they randomly went through the game, how it would work, using the fast function. And if it led into win, it got value plus one. If it went into a loss, it got value minus one. And then they basically just propagated this value up the network and combined it with the value that the position got in the value network. And because this is not enough, they also had to tweak it a bit, so they added another value that encouraged the algorithm to explore the space a bit more. And now you might be thinking, well, why didn't they use the, actually, the network that learned playing itself? Because that already had the information that the supervised network had, and it got even better because it was playing itself through many, many games. Actually, they, they tried that, but it wasn't as good, which is very interesting. And in the paper, they actually mentioned that the human, human players actually select a wider range of moves than the machine, which is interesting. So it still needed the human input to play very well. So now you should be asking this question. Can I do this at home? <laughs> well, depends on what hardware you have. <laughs> So the training altogether, it took almost a month. They trained it all on 50, C, 50 GPUs, because that's where you train your deep neural networks. And the slowest one was the supervised learning one, the one trained on the expert moves, which took three weeks on 50 GPUs. Then the reinforcement learning one that was training itself took just one day, that's a very short one, and then one week for the value network. And they actually also did two different versions of the AlphaGo algorithm. The standard one you can probably run on your desktop if you have a strong desktop, because it used just 48 CPUs and eight GPUs. <laughs> I have a stronger machine. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, this is not what they did in the actual games against the Go masters. What they did with the Go Masters, they actually created a distributed version. And I think Eric here, who will be speaking after me, knows something about that. And that used 40 search threads and 1,202 CPUs and 176 GPUs. So that's like, you can't really play that at home. <laughs> well, so yeah, you can see that the human was pretty miserable. Uh, but I want to stress one thing. Actually, the human player played two different sets of games against the machine. Uh, the five games that were used in all the paper and in uh, all the reporting about it, he lost all five of them against the machine. 
but he also played five informal games that had stricter time constraints, and there he lost only two, he lost three games out of five. So he won two times against the machine because the machine didn't have enough time to process that many simulations. So there is still hope. <laughs> and if you are now worried about like, AI taking over and oh my God, it's, so, it's actually like, thinking, well, if you put AlphaGo into a car, well, you don't want to be in that car. <laughs> well, it probably won't even start. So don't worry about AI, enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs>
So is it the case that for Go, the combination of human and machine is more efficient than machine alone and human alone? Well, I don't think they explored this area yet, but it probably is better. I mean, that would be my guess, but well, I haven't played with it personally, so that's, well, humans learn in a different way than machines because we can recognize patterns and we don't recognize them just as like, basically that, uh, that's hard to describe. Well, we recognize concepts and machines have very hard time doing that. So I think a human player combined with a machine that would do all the simulations would be like the power couple. <laughs> so there is still a future for humanity. <laughs> Thank you, Evelina. Thank, Thank you so you. much. <laughs> so the night continues um, with, uh, probably don't to say too much about Dr. Eric Brewer. Uh, I will say, if you have not seen the 2012 Recon keynote, uh, you should. It's a classic. Um, uh, but uh, he's at Google. Um, he's done a lot of work around network infrastructure, the CAP theorem, the Harvard versus Yield uh, paper. Uh, he's on one of my favorites. Um, uh, we're really uh, happy to have Eric here uh, talking about this really cool, uh, I really like this paper, the Process of the Monitors and Mesa uh, paper, the Experiences paper. Um, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. Honored to be here. This is the kind of going to be the eat your vegetables paper. I just got to warn you. But it's, I feel like it's partially my job to get this paper better known because it's actually influenced a bunch of things you're using and you don't likely know about it or at least not know enough about it. So the context is this is uh, 1980, roughly. This is when Xerox PARC was at its heyday. They had invented the first personal computer, uh, but also the laser printer and Ethernet. It's a good, good couple years. Um, also famously where Steve Jobs went to go see this early personal computer, which became the Lisa and then most famously the Macintosh. So the whole, this is what Xerox should have done was the Mac. Steve Jobs did it because Xerox couldn't. There's a whole book on that called Fumbling the Future, which I won't cover, but is very interesting about how Xerox had all this stuff and wasn't able to monetize it. Um, I know both authors, and uh, not, not well. I interviewed Dave Riddell about this paper last week just to see his, uh, what he thought about it. Uh, he also actually wrote the Ethernet spec, which is the project he did after this, so another thing worth reading, although not, not, as, not as fun as this one. So another thing that stands out is a super ambitious paper, kind of crazy. So what they're gonna do is build a follow-on hardware, so a new personal computer, Although it's really more like a mini computer, but they think of it as a personal computer for reasons we'll talk about. Uh, then you need a new Note OS for your new thing. And again, Unix was around, but not popular yet. Right? So they, hadn't, they didn't consider Unix. Uh, then apparently when you write a new OS, you also have to write a new language. This is the history of Multics and PL1 and Unix and C and now Mesa and Pilot. For some reason, you feel you need a new language when you write an OS. I don't really get that. It doesn't really make, it's having, actually I did that myself. I take the back. I wrote <laughs> Nest C for tiny OS, but uh, generally not a good idea to take on two things at once. And then on top of that, you actually have to write all the apps. So we'll get into why they did that. So um, a lot of stuff for a crazy team. That's one reason they probably weren't able to do all this. It's too ambitious. The language we'll talk about, Mesa, you'll, you'll recognize pieces of it in Java, which is definitely a place that shows up now. It's a lot of echo. What they were building, or what they thought they were building, was an enterprise solution. So it's Xerox they have to sell to. Move this down. I guess I can fix the paper myself. Better? Volume control. Um, so their mindset was, there's not many computers around. This is, no one, this is not, was pre-Bill Gates, right? So the idea is, not only not many computers around, there's not many programmers around. That programming wasn't like a procession that, that a lot of people would have. So what they're gonna do is, the machine's gonna come with all the apps that you ever need, right? <laughs> you, and in fact, you can't program the machine yourself. Only the Xerox specialists can program the machine. Right, that was wrong. Um, but it's a consequence of this, which is interesting, and you'll see this in Java 2, there is complete trust of all the code. 
So there is no untrusted code on this machine, which means it can run entirely in one address space. Right? And it does run, all the apps and the OS are all in the same address space. Uh, and it uses the language type safety and memory safety, a lot like Java does, to make sure that different threads can't interfere with each other. And in the presence of untrusted code, that's actually sufficient. Right? That's not a bad model if you have only code you trust. Although I don't know where you'd get such a situation anymore. The other thing that's interesting about this is when everything's in the same address space, you, when you think of like GDB, you're doing a GDB trace, you actually can see all the apps and all the OS. So when you do a trace, stack trace, it doesn't stop at the OS syscall. It goes right on into the OS because it's all in the same address space with the same symbol table. Right? So really cool for debugging, actually. So what's in the paper is two things that matter. Uh, language support for concurrency and kind of industrial strength concurrency management, which I think is the real set of reasons to, to read this paper. The second thing that's, that's not in here is nested monitors, which is what this paper was famous for at the time. I'm not even going to talk about it. Nested monitors is basically if I call into a locked object and it calls into other locked objects, I might get deadlock. <laughs> right? And that's kind of well known now. right? So it's not a big thing to talk about, and it's not a big part of the paper, but they're kind of like dismissed it in the paper, and I'm going to dismiss it in 20 minutes if we don't have time to cover it. Uh, next thing is they have processes, and they talk about processes in the paper, but I just told you it's all in one address space. So actually have is threads, not processes. So really this paper is how do you put threads in a programming language and then use them to build distributed systems. Actually, sorry, use them to build concurrent systems. They are actually not distributed generally. Uh, so they did a few things for this. They added first-class processes. You can pass processes around as a, as a, a pointer or a variable. Uh, fork join, detach is basically fork and telling me I don't ever plan to join it. So it's a free-running thread, like uh, ampersand in Unix shell. Um, it, they did a better job on monitors and condition variables, which I'll talk about. They have, uh, and the language itself is actually aware of concurrency. It turns out you cannot co write correct thread safe programs in C, <laughs> even though we do that all the time. Actually, things like memory barriers without only very recent changes to the C spec will actually cause C to be correct. And, the, and C is not alone with that problem. The actual term thread came up because when Xerox Park failed, this team moved to DEC. DEC was using Unix. They already had processes, so they needed a new term. So our modern word thread came from this project when they moved to DEC. So what is a monitor? A monitor is basically a, today we'd call it an object, but in this language it's a module, which is kind of a statically typed object. It has private data, so encapsulation. It has an implicit lock, meaning users don't write code to acquire and release the lock. The lock is part of the block structure. We'll show you an example in a minute. Uh, when you enter a monitor, that is a procedure that acquires the lock on entering and releases it on exit. So while you're in that procedure, you know you have mutual exclusion and you have access to the private data. Internal procedures are procedures that are not publicly accessible, but they're usually helper functions to help you uh, write easier, write better code. And then external functions are things that might do something with the state, but they don't acquire the lock. They often use for things like monitoring or statistics things that are not, you don't need mutual exclusion for. Now, here's a, this is the actual syntax from Mesa. So what you would see is you would, again, very st static in a sense of uh, like uh, files in C. Now you, you declare a monitor, it has the, the variable available, that's its private data. This one has two entry procedures, presumably for allocating and freeing something that's protected. Uh, and if you squint, you realize this, these are just, uh, this looks a lot like methods on an object, right? We'll get back to that on the next slide. The main point, though, of, of how you should think about a monitor is that it is enforcing an invariant, and if you're doing it right, the invariant's written down right at the top of the module. And in particular, you write your code assuming the invariant holds on entry, and then you have to make sure that it still holds on exit. Right. This is what you should always do with locks, but it's, it's very clean in the monitor sense that there's actually an invariant in the way you should think about this. So I said it feels a lot like an object. Here's a little mapping between Mesa and Java. In particular, the monitor data, that 
allocate field is the same as a private field in a Java object, because you can't access it from outside. The entry feature is a public method, but it's synchronized. The synchronized keyword in Java means implicitly acquire a lock on entry and release it on exit. That's exactly the monitor behavior. External is a public method that doesn't acquire a lock. Internal is a private synchronized method. And then in Mesa, you wanted a lot of monitored objects. You'd actually have to create an array of objects, right? And that's where actually Java is just better because in Java, when you create a new instance of an object, you get a new lock with it. So you can have a dynamic number of locks quite easily. So the object-oriented approach is actually strictly better than the monitor approach for dynamically created, heap-allocated, uh, locked objects. But you could kind of do it in Mesa using an array of locks. Now, first innovation, they said, is, is condition variables. So I'm going to explain how they work, and it's actually it's two things, it's complicated, but the complexity is not due to Mesa, it's fundamental, and it's still with us today. That's why I think it's worth covering. So condition variable, you wait on a condition, you get notified when the condition is true. That's the general idea. In Mesa, it's not quite the same. So what happens is you're using wait inside a monitor function, which means you're holding the lock. Right? Because you're holding the lock, the invariant may not be true. It was true when you entered, but now you've done some stuff, you may have screwed the invariant up. So first thing you have to do when you call wait is restore the invariant, because you're releasing the lock and someone else can see the state and you don't want them to see it in the state where the invariant doesn't hold. So if you're thinking about invariants correctly, then you would know, oh, I did a wait, I have to restore the invariant before the call to wait. Well, that's interesting fact number one about Mesa's view of wait. The second thing is it actually is too hard to make a single condition and notification work. So I'll get back to this in a second, but the way it works in Mesa is uh, I'm always gonna use wait in a loop. And so at the top of my loop, I will check a condition, the, which is not exactly necessarily the same as the condition of the condition variable. It's a condition that I think uh, I care about. And so what it, when you wait, when you wake up from wait, you recheck that condition. So at the end of that loop, what you know is that the condition holds. And you're really guaranteed that it holds because at this point, not only did you check the condition, but you hold the lock. So nobody else could have changed it. Right, so this combination of reacquiring the lock implicitly and checking the condition guarantees the condition holds. So what's nice about it compared to previous condition variables is two things. Um, one is that you can notify as a hint, right? It's fine to say, oh, this is, actually, it's on my next slide. I should just go to it, but. Um, so going back to the invariant part, we will wait, to re we will restore the invariant. When we finish the wait, we, are, we have reacquired the lock. We know the invariant still holds, right? So we get to restart knowing that it holds. No one broke it. So the way to think about the contribution here is, is before Mesa, you would wait on a condition that was implicit, maybe documented, maybe not, and notify meant whatever condition you're waiting on, it's now true, right? But it wasn't actually very specific what the condition was, and people could be confused about it. Um, Mesa does their version for two reasons. One is it's easier to implement, and the reason is because I can notify you even if the condition is not true, right? Before, I, the condition had to absolutely 100% be sure be true because you were going to wake up and assume it was true. Now you wake up and you don't assume it's true, you check it, so now I can notify you whenever I want. In fact, that frees up a bunch of deadlock situations where if you don't know what to do, you can wake up everybody, right? And they'll all check their condition. And, but the other thing it does is, is give you kind of a locality, meaning that different parts of your code can have slightly different conditions, and as long as you wake them up conservatively, then the code's actually cleaner because everybody says what condition they're waiting on, they check it, and you can just notify on a superset. So it actually gives you a much more flexible structure. All right. Now, that was complicated. We have one more, more complicated thing. Maybe I should just, just have the time to stop here for a second and say, before this paper, there were condition variables, but I would say people didn't know how to use them correctly. Modern day, I would say, people don't know how to use them correctly. <laughs> <laughs> they should read this paper, <laughs> right? Because you want to have a, 
a condition notification that is a superset of what you want, and you actually want this loop, and you actually want to have the condition written down every place you're checking await, because it's self-documenting and very clean and very likely to be right over time. So if I don't see a loop like this, I'm very suspicious. So here's another thing that got right that's uh, missing today, which is, well, first they added exceptions. Many languages now have exceptions, but exceptions were new at this time. And in particular, since this is an alternate return path, they were very aware that you're returning back up the stack as you return exceptions. And in general, they have a statement that you can think of as being the direct influencer of try, catch, finally in Java, which is, here's an unwind statement. You run this statement when you are returning on the exception path of a stack frame. So ideally, every stack frame would have an unwind statement to clean up the state of that stack frame, right? Java basically says, if you can get an exception, you have to catch it. That reasoning comes directly from this paper. Right? Um, now, it's hard to write catches, you may have noticed. It's kind of a pain, right? This is the paper that says why you need to do it. Um, but it's worse than an invariant, and that's the part that gets interesting. Inside, sorry, inside a monitor. So unwanted a monitor means I'm about to exit the stack frame, which means I am leaving the monitor. So our number one rule is the monitor protects an invariant. I have to restore the invariant on unwind. So the, the contract with the language is essentially, if you have an unwind statement, then I'm going to assume you are restoring the invariant, and you know what you're doing, and I will release the lock at the end of unwind. If you don't have an unwind statement, I'm going to deadlock. And that's an interesting choice, and I think it's arguably the right choice. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is, which is by the way what we all do all the time, is something's <laughs> going on with the lock, I release the lock. Or I have a Unix locked file thing, and something's stuck, I delete the file lock. <laughs> That's releasing the lock without doing an unwind. Right? And what's the consequence of that? The consequence of that is the state of your system is unknown. Right? You are guaranteed that eventually you will delete a lock while the state is in a bad spot and no one will fix it except for you by hand through some terrible process. <laughs> right, and you, this, lots of systems have this problem. But in general, we do not know how to release locks by third parties, right? If you kill a th process that's holding locks, bad things happen, <laughs> right? The way to have bad things not happen would be to have an unwind in that process that actually restores the invariant those locks are protecting then they can release the locks and no bad things would happen. So that's what you should all actually be doing. I'm very sure you're not doing it. I don't do it very often either, to be fair. Um, but this is in the paper, right? So the reason you don't release the lock is it's better to stop in a deadlock, which means all the state, no corrupted state is visible, right? If I release the lock, there's no deadlock, but now I've released corrupted state out into the world. Those are your two options, basically. Neither one's great, but the deadlock one is much easier to debug, right? Because the system stops, you can see what locks are held. You can say, oh, I didn't have an unwind. No wonder it's stuck, right? And again, this is a personal computer. The programmers are the owners of the machine. The mindset is we will personally fix it when that happens. It's a little different if this was a customer site and you're like, oh, okay, customer, your machine's deadlocked, just send it to us, we'll, we'll fix it, right? <laughs> Not that realistic. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up and take some questions. There's a bunch of stuff I didn't cover in here, but the, the actual contributions are figuring out how to have concurrency in a language, which again, you directly see in Java, you directly see it in Modula 2, and a whole bunch of languages that came after that. They kind of show how to use condition variables, which we still need to learn from. And they really did a nice job of saying, if you want an invariant, then there's all the things you have to do. And in particular, every time you leave a monitor, by whatever path, exceptional or not, you have to restore the invariant. That's the most important thing to do. I didn't cover integrating notifies from IO devices, which they did a nice job on. Uh, this is the first paper that talks about priority inversion and priority inheritance 
is another whole separate topic that you could spend some time on. And how to do nested monitors, which I said is really just, oh, if you have cycles, you get deadlock. Right? Don't have cycles. Right? E e very common knowledge now, but was kind of new in 1980. All right, so I'll stop here and take some questions. We have about two, two minutes. Oh, sorry, I thought I saw a hand. No? Any questions? Oh, here we go. I'll take questions on other topics, too, by the way. <laughs> so you mentioned that, uh, that you thought that Java was strictly better than Monitor when it came to handling uh, numerous locks. Dynamically allocated. Yeah. Monitored you, objects, basically. Yeah, can you explain that a little bit more? So you, you have an array of like separate locks, and you're managing all of those instead of just having one lock? Well, the way Mesa started was really you, a monitor is, is kind of like a, a file, right? If there's one monitor per file, right? Kind of like a, a um, uh, I can't remember the word. Sorry, come to me. Anyway, the... Uh, if you want to have one monitor lock per process, then when you create a process, you have to create a monitor for it. That's very natural in an object-oriented language. You just create a, a, a process object, and it includes implicitly the lock. So the allocation and freeing of that storage is, is built into the notion of an object. With a monitor record, there is no such notion of dynamic allocation of memory. So it's either an array, or, which could be dynamic allocated, but you're kind of, it's still awkward compared to having an instance for each separate entity. So it's really the dynamic allocation of instances that is why the object approach is, is a better approach. Where's a good place to learn this stuff in a modern language? And not like, not like modern English, like colloquialism. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I still teach this class at Berkeley, this paper at Berkeley, because it's the best paper to walk through these issues, even though the terminology is old. Um, I feel like people could write that book, or that it doesn't even need to be long. I mean, you can do the right thing in Java or C++. It's just not easy. It's not automatic. Would you write your next uh, system in Mesa today? <laughs> no, I. I, I Probably, actually, I am writing it in Go, I would say. <laughs> and it doesn't actually have objects either, but it can do all the things that are in this. <clears throat> that was a great talk. I really appreciated it. Um, in terms of like language development, why do you think kind of comprehensive system views like this have kind of gone out of vogue, like in, in kind of the PL research and systems research setting? Well, I'm not sure I would agree with that. I think there's at least two examples. There's probably more, but both Go and Rust have a kind of systems-y feel that is in our modern languages on many fronts. So I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of both of those. I haven't played with Rust as much as I've played with Go, but Go has got the advantages of garbage collection and good typing and memory safety, but it also, and it feels Java C-ish pretty well, but it does a good job on distributed systems, which uh, most languages don't do. But, so I would say there's some exceptions, but it, it took a while for those to get back. It's also really hard to do a new language, frankly, so you need a little bit of momentum. Anyone else? What, time for one more? No? All right, thank you, Eric. All thank right, you so much. You. That was fantastic. <laughs> Inez Sombra is here. She um, is the reason papers we love I think is a thing, really. Uh, we, you know, we started here in New York, uh, San Francisco. Uh, she emailed us um, right after and was like, you know, I want to, I want to start papers we love too in San Francisco, and it just happened. And then, you know, we had like 35 chapters later, right? It's an amazing thing. So, you know, it's it's, it's really really cool. Uh, but we have Ines here, uh, who's in town for QCon as well. Um, she's a distributed systems engineer at Fastly. Um, she does speak a little fast. Be prepared, baby. Yeah, it's, it's you know copyright. Um, but uh, we're really excited to have her. She's really amazing. I think um, we wouldn't be here today uh, if it wasn't for Ines Sombra. So I, I, I got a round a round of applause just for her before I talk. I, it's amazing. Um, uh, yeah. 
And uh, you know, she's helping us run the Papers We Love Conf as well. It's very, very, very exciting. Uh, it, it, that's really great. So uh, without further ado, um, Ines Sombra, everybody. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Good? All right. So there's a few things that are the worst thing that could happen before your talk. One of them is just coming immediately after Egg Brewer. The other one is being like put on the spot. Thank you, Tishan. Uh, we're, we're doing great. So all right, so I'm here to talk to you about Iron Fleet, and this is going to be an extremely opinionated introduction to, to the paper. So I don't really think necessarily that I can do it just in the, in the time that I have, so you're here to just like, now you're going to be like subjected to my take on it. And uh, since you're my captive audience, this is what we're doing right now. So as Sishon said, my name is Ines, I am at Random Mood at the Twitters, and yeah, I help run the Paper Sale Love chapter in San Francisco. And believe it or not, I've I introduced many, it's like we've got two years, almost three, of running a, a, a meetup, but this is the first time I speak at a paper we love, so, so this is like, uh, this is kind of crazy. Uh, what I'm going to do today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about system verification, and then I'm going to give you my pitch for the paper that I selected, or the paper that I liked, and then we're going to have like some parting thoughts. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you were at the conference. Uh, who was at Katie's talk? Anybody was there? Okay, so there's a few people. So there's, there's still, like, I'm just gonna do very briefly about system verification. If you want a better survey, you should watch Katie's talk. And this is kind of like the idea, like this is the scale of this talk, which is gonna be like there, somewhere in North America, and then it's gonna be like a 15 minute introduction. So uh, please adjust your expectations. And this is the goal when it comes to system verification. This is the goal. So I, this is how I think about it. Uh, so it helps us uh, to eliminate bugs a priori, and, and, and it can be difficult to apply at a, full, uh, at a full program scale. So we know we have two ways, kind of, like we have in one side formal methods, and in the other side we have scholarly testing. The paper that Katie is going to cover immediately after deals with scholarly testing, and what I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit in the formal methods uh, realm. And then they're both at odds, and they do different things, and they have different ethos. And, and since we're going to talk about formal methods, let's just like let's just like summarize a little bit about um, like what are the characteristics. And then normally they're targeted to smaller components. Uh, you tend to think about them as uh, you do a high investment, uh, like all up front, and then you have high rewards because you get greater levels of confidence uh, that your application is doing the right thing. And when they apply correctly, they tend to result in system with the highest integrity. And the correctness is all tied to a specification that you provide, and you still have to implement it after. There are several types of formal methods. You have things like human-assisted proofs, model checking, lightweight formal methods, uh, and yeah. So, so that's all I want you to know right now. When we talk about formal methods, you tend to hear this thing, that they're tedious, slow, and they're difficult to get right. And then after you've done all of this, you still have to go ahead and implement it, which could like, you can still like mess it up when you're implementing it. But, but in a nutshell, what, what all of these things try to do is just like try to be able to just like give you guarantees behind two different, different types of properties. So we're talking about like either safety or liveness properties. A safety property is something that uh, where like something bad never happens. You get an assurance that something bad is never going to happen. Uh, and then formal methods try to find invariant violations to show that there's like a program is like, is, is like keeping the safety property. Liveness means that something good eventually happen. And in, in ensuring liveness is, is something that is critical since a liveness bug may render your entire system unusable. So the, all of these definitions are in the paper, so you can go and read a little bit more. A thing that the paper mentions is that uh, when it comes to safety, the only thing that we need to reason about is like two system states at a time. We go from A to B. And a behavior is safe if like, the steps between the states preserves the system invariance. We've heard this word before, and invariant is something that has to go through. Uh, in liveness, it's a little bit different. We have to reason about an infinite series of system states. And it can be super challenging, because uh, theorem provers or any, or any of the tools that we have available like, have to explore anything, like infinite amount of states. So obviously, uh, it's likely that they're never going to finish, and then you're going to time out. And then there's really not a lot of like, help that you get when it comes to, uh, to proving liveness properties. So this is how we feel about it. Uh, they tell us that it'd be hard. So all right. So we did a little bit of like this. We know that there's some types of things that we could do to prove a system correct. And we know that some, like in, in the not, like, the, like the, just the nutshell of it all is that we want to make, um, get guarantees behind these two properties. But by this point, I'm just starting to get really tired. Like we have to do a lot of work, and then we still have to implement it. Whereas like, you know, now like you may just start implementing it, and then you put some testing on it, and maybe you get close to have like some degree of assurance that maybe you're doing the right thing. 
but you can't really be like correct. Like you don't get any guarantees. So when I started thinking about this a long time ago, I'm like, okay, I tend to go and then into like a spike where like two years I look at what is going on and then I just like, I'm like, eh. And then two years later, I'm like, is there anything better coming up? And then just like, I'm like, ah. And then just like, I keep going and this cycle keeps repeating. But last year, I found this paper that I really like and then when I read it, it was kind of like, ah, oh, it blew my mind. And it blew my mind probably for the different thing that it will, like, if you read it, it's probably that you're not going to agree with me on why I thought that this paper was, was, was kind of amazing. But I will, I will walk you through why uh, it made an impression with me. So it comes from the blessed Microsoft Research, one of the few bastions that is producing this type of, like, uh, this type of paper, this type of literature. And, uh, and again, like, we know that maybe practical formal verification, uh, this was like the thing that I had, like, the, or the bias, or like the preconception that I had. That is maybe like, in order to actually be useful and helpful, uh, it may be a long time away from, from where we are. This paper maybe poses the question that maybe we're not that far away as we thought we were. So it's like, maybe we're wrong? Ah, it's interesting. So any paper that gives you that like funny feeling that maybe you don't necessarily understand, or maybe there's something else that can prove you uh, wrong in a way that helps you out, maybe a good thing, then this paper has that feeling for me. So this is my pitch for the paper. What does the paper do? It introduces a methodology that slices a system into specific layers to make verification of practical distributed system implementations feasible. So I highlighted the two words that, that, uh, that are ringing true with me that already make me feel happy when they say practical and feasible. Uh, <laughs> if you see anything else, like you don't get to see those two words in the same paper ever. So, and they also tell me that it, I can do this with a tolerable proof burden. So, okay, that's great. Uh, okay, like we like slice things into layer. Where are these layers? We have a high level spec, a distributed protocol, and an implementation. In the high level spec, we give a simple and succinct definition of the system behavior. The protocol layer or the distributed protocol layer this deals with, um, with just the protocol design, and they use some tricks uh, to like help the verification. And at the implementation layer, you just have to like reason about a single host program without worrying about concurrency at all. So this is the way that they, they, they just like, they tackle the program, the problem. And they do this and then they bind all together with something that, that is called refinements, uh, which I hadn't really, like I guess I hadn't really like, like put them together in my head either. And then they, in the paper they walk you through why the refinements help you go from one level, from the high level specs all the way down without, without just like, without risking getting it wrong at any of these three levels that you're doing. So they connect us, they help us connect the stages and assert that we're doing the right things. So why do you want to read this paper? Uh, you may also want to read this paper because it's the first system uh, to, uh, they, they state that they, they, it's the first system that mechanically like verifies liveness properties of a practical protocol and also like in their implementation. So, so until now, uh, anything that we could do like, so we have like safety and then safety, we could just like have a, have a proof and then maybe we like, we just like prove safety. But liveness, well, as I told you before, it was just like, it's really, really difficult to prove and then nothing else was there to help us. And uh, these researchers said that they're like the first paper or the first system that actually we can like, helps us do this mechanically. Uh, if you're not convinced yet, uh, you really you should go read it. Uh, it also gives us like the, the, the system has proofs that they reason where they reason all the way down to the bytes of the UDP packet sent on the network, uh, and they guarantee correctness despite packet drops, reordering, so duplication. And uh, it's interesting because at this point I'm treating this as like marketing wear, where I'm like, sure you do, uh, <laughs> but the paper is there, so you can go and read it. And then just since it comes in a paper format, I'm much more, uh, I'm much less skeptical about it. So okay, like, we just like summarize and put it in the slide. And and they do this, and they they, they carry all of the things, or or they, they have two artifacts that where they they prove all of the things, or like they 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 bake all of the things in. And they use this in two dif different uh, systems that they built. One is called Iron uh, RSL, and then the other one is called Iron KV. Iron RSL is a Paxos-based replicated state machine library. Iron KV is a shared key value store. They kind of say that Iron RSL could be like a twin to Paxos, so in order to Paxos to like Zookeeper or something else. And then you can think about Iron KV, um, like something that could compete with Redis, and they actually do some benchmarking against Redis too. So in the two systems, like they use different, they, they use uh, distribution and no distribution in RSL for reliability, 
And for KV, the usage is like, so they can move uh, hotkeys to dedicated machine and the user for performance. Uh, they also benchmark the systems because they, they, I think that the reason that they, they decided to do these two use cases, my hair is making noise, uh, is because they're trying to prove that this, 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 this approach or this methodology actually works in the things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis. So like normally you think about a distributed system as something that is not unprovable, that it's not like just we can't really like get a lot of certainties and also that it's just in the wall is very, very hard. They feel like, okay, just like grab Zookeeper, get ready, it's like look. It works for these two use cases. Um, all right, uh, another thing that they do on this one is like I'm giving you the punchline of the paper, but the things that they managed to prove in IronSL, like the, we get these guarantees after this methodology gets applied, that we have complete functional correctness and one key liveness property, which is like pretty important. Uh, if the network uh, is eventually synchronous for a live quorum of replicas, then a client repeatedly submitted a request eventually gets a reply, pretty cool. And in, when it comes to the Iron KV guarantees, uh, that if the network is fair, then reliable transmission uh, of components eventually deliver each message. Those are pretty, like, pretty significant guarantees to get. So um, due to time, I can show you a little picture of what you could see in the paper if you go, and then describe how they go from one, from one tier to the other one, and then just like, so, so they use the refinements in the middle. Uh, in the specification of the high level, this is kind of like what it looks like. And also, uh, they mentioned in the paper that they, they, the specifications need to be very succinct. So what you're distilling is what you're, like, what you're, like, the intent of your entire uh, application. And their specs for the, the Iron RSL is 85 lines, and for KV is 34 lines. So that's pretty amazing. So that's good. Um, yeah, it's just like you want to keep it succinct and easy to follow. In the protocol, they introduce the concept of individual host and then they communicate only via network messages. This is when we talk about like concurrency. And they prove that they, uh, you also have to prove when you get to the protocol level that the protocol is a refinement of the spec that you had at the high level. So they give you mechanisms to do this and then the way that they do it is by baking in TLA style techniques uh, and then they use it in the Daphne language with a language that, that they just do this. Like, so, so they use the Daphne language and these techniques and then a couple tricks to actually help you go, help you make sure that your protocol is a refinement of the higher level spec. And then we get to the next stage where we have to implement this, and then, okay, at this point, we are like in single threaded, uh, single -threaded world, we don't have to worry about concurrency, and uh, again, we continue to use Daphne, and then in here, we have to prove that our implementation refines the protocol that we've like proven that the protocol refines the higher level spec. So we have this little chain of things that prove that, they, that we are refining onto the, we are refining from the high level spec. And, and at this point, it's like we get this process of making sure that we're doing the right thing at every step that we're going. So a little bit of like, this is in there, like it, uh, this is another figure in the paper. So they talk about like how many lines on the implementation. And then this is the, thing, the cool thing. It's like how much time it took them to verify the implementation correct. If you wanna check it out, all of the things are on GitHub, which is another really nice thing. But, um, but that is not necessarily what, what blew my mind. So I told you a few things, and it's like, that is not really what blew my mind. And the thing that blew my mind dealt with this, like the developer use and experience. So this is a little like, screenshot of their Visual Studio code, and at some point they have this, this thing where they can just like, whatever you do, you can go to Travis, and it will run all your code, and tells you in the IDE, and if you're like, failing any sort of unit tests, and what they tell us in this paper uh, is that Daphne provides near real-time IDE integrated feedback, and as the developer writes a given method or proofs, she typically sees feedback in one and 10 seconds indicating whether the verifier is satisfied. So you can run your unit tests, and also you can know uh, if your change is correct. So that's kind of amazing. And then they tell us that their build system tracks dependencies across files and outsources in parallel each file's verification to a cloud and uh, a full integration can, can be six hours in practice, but normally you would see something in, in more about six to eight minutes. It's like, I don't know, if you're trying to even verify like some of the chef recipes, it may take you like an hour for that shit to finish. <laughs> six to eight minutes to know correct, and it's pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty legit. So another thing that they tell us is like, okay, they use all sorts of things, like their real life system. We have replication, view changes, log truncation, batching for things for performance, so like they, they, their performance, like the performance implementations of, of something that exists in the world, 
and it's not a toy example, and even KV uh, does delegation and reliable de de delivery. And again, the biggest, like also huge telling point is that they wrote it, they, they proved it, they knew that it was correct, and then they ran it, and it worked the first time that they ran it. So that's pretty legit, and this is my face whenever I read this. It's like, <laughs> I want to live in this world. I want to live in the world where these things are done for me, and I, I'm like, fine, whatever. I will have to use the language called Daphne. I honestly don't give a shit as long as my, I, I get all of this. I, I'm okay with learning like Daphne, and, and, and I want to live in this world, and I, and I think that this is the thing that was pretty amazing to me. It's like, maybe we're getting to the point where, where this is going to be part of our existence, and I don't have to do this loop that every two years I go like, oh, is there anything that can help me? No, uh, uh, whatever. Also, I took a, a formal methods class in college when I was doing grad school, and it was one of the worst experiences of my life, and I just <laughs> didn't get it. So it's kind of like the one that got away. Every two years, I was like, maybe I'll get it this year, and it's like, oh, no. So. So yes, so this is something that was like very dear to me because of like that humiliating experience. Uh, another trick that they use, they mentioned that they use TLA embedding to like uh, to a library of fundamental like um, fundamental things. So they just pick all of the things. And I'm not sure if the trick here is that they grab people and then wrote enough TLA like primitives or TLA functions into a library uh, that allows me not to have to write them, and, and I'm okay with that as well. Uh, <laughs> But like, kudos to them to actually, for actually like doing this. Uh, so again, another point from Microsoft Research. And the thing that got, this got me thinking is that, all right, so like, say that we get this at some point. It's like, then what are the things that we do right now are going to look like? It's like, how are we going to write tests? Or what, what are our tests going to mean like, in, in a future where we can actually know if our program is correct in six to eight minutes? So that, that is the thing. It's like, I don't know. I don't know how that is going to look. Also, like the libraries of TLA plus method for liveness. I don't know if that's cheating or not. I don't know if they're generalizable or not. I'm like, it's like, great. Uh, if I can prove uh, liveness, uh, I don't know. Like, and then also, like, they have, uh, they did mention in the paper that it's trickier to verify imperative code than purely functional code. So that's another insight that was very interesting. So I'm already at the grind out of time, but that, that was a really interesting piece because I never thought about functional code. Well, I guess like, I did know that functional was easier to verify, but uh, like, I mean, this guy's like mentioned it, like, how much easier it is for going to functional, and they do like this roundabout where they do several implementations, and then they just eventually converge into something that is like functional. So I'll check the paper, and that's all I have. And if you really want to read it, hopefully I made a good, a good uh, sell for it. Uh, it's linked to the repo that I have here, and that's all I got, 16 minutes. Yeah. So well, thank you. I blew through my questions, so, so that's fine. I'll just I'll give the thing to get it. Questions? Oh, am I, am I on the hook for questions? Nope. Yeah. We can probably take one or two. Sure, I, I hope this question is comprehensible. So in the proof that in the presence of a network which is eventually synchronous, you get an answer to your Paxos question, right? How sharp is the result? Do you get um, an upper bound? I'm not uh, sure. Read the paper. OK, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and if Thank you understand you. that, explain it to me, please. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Yep. Oh, cool. Anyone else? No, we're good. OK. Oh, yep, sir. Uh, I, is this on? Yes, it is. Uh, I just wondered how fragile the verification was. Like, if there's a dozen mistakes, does it just detect this one? Or well, according to the paper, it's not fragile at all. You just get to use like math and everything to make sure that that is. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, like, for instance, in a, in a when a compiler is checking code and you make one mistake, sometimes you get hundreds of errors. Is it I think that the reason that this one is different is because you don't go from the compiler; you go from the intent. And then you refine, refine, refine until you're in the compiler. But at the time that you get to the compiler and the time that you get to the code, because I think Daphne like compiles into C sharp, at that point you like you know that you're doing the right thing because you started from the intent of what you wanted to do. So I think the perspective changes there. So that was the thing that was interesting to me because now I get to start on something that is completely tied to the development process. If you try to use something else like a formal method, you can write a proof. And that's the only thing that you have in order to know that your idea may be correct. But then when you implement that proof, it's not connected to that process, so you can still fuck it up. So in this case, it's like they're all linked together. OK. Last Hi. one. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you made an interesting point, right? Like, So in a lot of PO research, we, we kind of um, 
we kind of approach things by saying, well, look, like we have these languages uh, that we can write in, like Agda or something like this, and we can extract code, and it's going to be perfectly correct. And and so, you know, the, this paper made that argument, but what you found interesting was the kind of structural editing verification kind of point of it, right? Yeah, and so, I know. so maybe there's a maybe no, but so so my my kind of question is, you know, to everybody doing PL research and thinking about languages, maybe we should think about. Bake uh, it into the RE. We're marketing these things. Yeah. Wrong, right? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Like, the thing is, like, in this one, it's just like, then I don't have to write three languages in order to do that. It's just like they came already integrated, and it was just like the shortcut was there. And I'm like, I don't know about you, but I'm already behind on my, on my, on my beta. <laughs> so <laughs> believe it or not, it's just like, I'm not going to go and pick data loss. Although, like, I would love to, so I could use something like Molly to reason about things. But then eventually, still, like, I mean, Unless you do like something that is like your PL language that I can use to verify, then it compiles to go and then something else or something else that my company already is using, then that helps me out. If not, then it's still like very difficult. And, and I mean, like I remember that tweet where you and Diego were discussing why he didn't prove uh, Raft on using TLA plus and even he gave up. So if he gave up that he was like getting paid as a PhD, then what is the hope for me? Like I have to ship it in this quarter. So I don't know. I'm very worried about this thing. So, <laughs> so yes. Okay. Some good questions. Thank you, Inez. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're coming to our last talk of the night. Just I, I guess I didn't ask this earlier. Who is here the first time at Papers We Love? Cool. Uh, so it's really cool. So obviously it's like very different. We're doing these like 20-minute talks. Uh, usually our meetups are like one and one hour, hour and a half, two hours if you're Brian Cantrell. Um, uh, so you definitely, uh, you know, take a look at our videos and stuff, uh, but it's cool that you're here. Um, so <clears throat> to that, Katie McCaffrey has spoken at, f this will be her fourth Papers We Love today. Her f she'll do her fifth one in Portland uh, at the end of June, uh, which is really awesome. Uh, she's talked about the Sagas paper, the Orleans paper, uh, a bunch. So Katie's really great. Uh, she gave a great talk earlier today at QCon um, about verification of distributed systems. People have already talked about it. Um, she works at Twitter as a distributed systems engineer. Um, <clears throat> she worked at 343 Studios on games like Halo, uh, Microsoft Research for a while as well. Um, she's done amazing work. Uh, we're really glad to have her in New York, first time in New York, which is really awesome, uh, talking about this really cool paper. Uh, that was also mentioned earlier. Simple testing can prevent most critical failures. Um, and... Uh, yeah, take it away, Katie. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm Mike. Great. Um, hi. Thank you for staying to see my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about this paper that came out in 2014 called Simple Testing Can Prevent Most Critical Failures because this is a, a paper I like for a variety of reasons, but one of them is because it's this nice sort of partnership between academia and industry and academia being interested in solving some of the problems we have in industry. And it's also like incredibly useful now. Um, so I like those kinds of papers where you read it and you're like, oh, I know what to do um, in my job today. So let's get started. Uh, like Zeeshan said, I am Katie McCaffrey. Uh, this is where I am on the internet. Please talk to me. I do that. My DMs are open if you want to like not ask a question in public. That's totally fine. Uh, I work on Twitter or on Twitter right now. I work at uh, on platform and infrastructure observability. I was the tech lead of observability and recently just switched to uh, do building distributed build tools, which is totally new and interesting. Uh, but yeah, so I wrote this article in the ACMQ uh, that got published in November, December in ACMQ, and then in February in the communications of the ACM about how we verify a distributed system. And, and the point of all of this was not to just be like use formal methods because like no one in the industry is going to do that unless maybe you're Amazon. Um, but and they did it and it like worked and I talk about that. But anyway, that's not this talk. Um, the idea is to give you some practical advice on like what you can do at your job today uh, to increase the confidence that your system is doing the right thing. So one of the papers I talk about in this uh, this report I wrote is simple testing can prevent most critical failures. Uh, and the first time, I think Inez actually showed me this paper, so thanks Inez. Um, I read this, I was just totally like, oh my god, like this is everything I want in a paper. Also, it gives you all of the ammo when people say I don't want to write test cases to be like, write some test cases. <laughs> so let's, let's do a, a tour of this paper because it's cool. So what they did in this paper is they analyzed failures in real world systems and they basically went and looked at a bunch of open source projects that uh, are distributed systems that deal with data. So Cassandra, HBase, HDFS, MapReduce, and Redis. 
And then they went and sampled all of their like issues in their bug tracking systems and they randomly sampled them to get 198. And then they started like categorizing all of these. So most of these are Java, which I think is interesting to note and I'll point that out in some of the results. Um, but they started categorizing these failures and they actually reproduced about half of them or like a, a third of them. Uh, and, then, and then they analyzed like why these things happened and the root cause of this. And then they gave us some findings in this paper. Uh, which is 14 pages, but actually goes really fast because it's mostly just like understanding the findings. So uh, one of the biggest findings was, or the, one of the first findings they talk about is that 77% of the failures require more than one input event to manifest. So um, basically like our bugs are complicated, like you have to have more than one input uh, to, to break something. So at least we're doing a pretty good job and just like testing the base cases usually, uh, except for 23% of the time, but ignore that one. Um, and then, <laughs> Most of the failures though, there's hope, right? Most of the failures actually can be reproduced with mo no more than three inputs, uh, so 90% of them. So that's actually you know, a reasonable number of inputs to actually start verifying the state space of. So some hope there. Uh, they then went on to talk a lot about the complexity of the failures we see. And so uh, while they sort of categorized inputs into these different types of events that could happen, like uh, if a, a file or database, right, uh, starting a service, config change was the big one. Um, that I think was just like the bucket of like, uh, we don't know what happened, there must have been a config change, like throw it in that bucket, because like config changes cause a lot of bad things to happen. Uh, node restart, data corruption, all these kinds of other things. Uh, they basically sort of found, and, and the idea of classifying this like, was like this, is you only have limited time in testing, because you know, you have to like ship something. Um, then like, where do you spend your effort? So they found that 50% of the errors required one of the events to be starting a service. So this could be a restart or actually just like booting the service. So probably we should test the startup path more. 24% um, of the, the, the events to cause these errors were 24 uh, was an unre unreachable node. So we still have problems when nodes fail uh, in about a quarter of our cases. So that's still a, a hard problem. Uh, fault injection tests are recommended to sort of weed some of these out. And then this 23% uh, involving configuration change or misconfigurations. Uh, they found that a lot of them are basically like you enable rarely used features and then it crashes the whole system. So um, uh, they don't actually talk about this, but if you were following along with like uh, some of the game day stuff when like Stripe enabled a config change and then like took down their master node and then they came back up and erased all the data in the system, that's a rarely used config change bug. So it sort of like leads us to me when I'm building system, I use this to say like, hey, if this is some weird config option that we're not gonna test or use or expect people to do, like don't include it. Like don't one off stuff for like, you know, maybe it might happen someday because someone's gonna use it in a way that you totally didn't expect. Um, obviously we like have to have some complexity in our systems, but you know, keep it simple when you start. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting, and this sort of changed a, a, a widely held belief that I had, was that uh, three nodes or less can reproduce 98% of the failures they found. So I, uh, I was actually in the camp of you have to have like, you know, these big staging environments that sort of mimic production to find some of the really gnarly bugs and reproduce like what's happening in prod. And like you could never catch this thing that happened in prod because we're not going to invest in like a prod like staging environment. That's not true. You can uh, stand up three nodes and do most of the failures that happen here. And that was actually really cool because now it, it sort of says like we should invest in doing this. I think a lot of people just don't because of that widely held assumption. Um, I like this one a lot too because I'm a big fan of unit tests and a lot of people aren't for some reason uh, or whatever. Uh, but anyway, so basically, <laughs> I don't know. I don't wanna like rag on uh, any one person in particular. particular. But uh, basically you can, they basically found that 77% of these um, failures could be re reproduced by a unit test case. And so, and what they're going on to say is they do keep reiterating in this paper, and I actually believe this very fully, is that the stuff we are doing is very, very hard. So like having a bug in your code does like not mean you're a bad person. And the fact that you didn't catch it until like you did exhaustive testing or maybe it went into production, unfortunately, is not a failure. What it does mean though is that we can write a really simple unit test case once we understand that failure and that failure will never happen again. And that's great, because that's like really inexpensive to write a unit test case. Um, this may seem super counterintuitive, but they did find in all the failures that they analyzed that 74% of the failures were deterministic. They are not these uh, gnarly like, oh, this happens like once in a blue moon because we flipped a coin like a thousand times and it came up heads, all of them, right? 
Not, not actually the case. Uh, there's not randomness, like as long as you get the same set of inputs, the, the same uh, problem will manifest in a system. So that also gives, gives me hope that we <laughs> might have a chance of doing something correctly. So, so basically what they're getting to with all this complexity stuff is that the way we sort of top down do testing a lot of the times in these distributed systems, and, and a lot of these systems are fairly heavily tested, is via fault injection or state space exploration, and this is incredibly expensive. Um, and so what they're trying to show us is that like, hey, the space is like reduced a little bit, but it's still really expensive. So what else can we do? Where can we focus our efforts on writing unit tests, increasing our coverage, uh, increasing our integration tests and fault injections, uh, and targeting them so that we can get the, the most bang for our buck and find the most errors? So one of the things that they started to say is that your logs are actually incredibly valuable. 76% um, of the failures actually were printed explicitly to the log. 84% of those failure, uh, of the triggering failures were, uh, were in the log uh, and could be reproduced from the logs just themselves. So you could generally rebuild it. Um, this is kind of the sad part though. <laughs> the, the average in the, or the median number of messages per error in the log was 824. So I don't really ever want to read that, especially at like 4 a.m. Um, and, and, and this is sort of like I think a prevailing thing that's happening. Um, logs, this is just a personal opinion that we're going to diverge from the paper to go on like a little personal rant of mine. Um, logging, the way we currently log, is a leftover artifact from how we used to build systems when there was like literally three machines in the system that was like your web server and your database and like maybe a front end, like an Nginx server. Um, and so you could like reasonably read all of those logs and we used to have like strings and like totally unformatted and it was whatever like the sysadmin thought was useful. Uh, that's like not the case anymore when you have hundreds of nodes in a cluster that are doing something and like spamming this much information to the log across like the whole cluster. Um, and so what we have done is build all these tools that will aggregate all these random strings and then like search them. But turns out like here's a hint, like, like string parsing is not getting faster. Like that's not gonna happen. Uh, so we should stop doing unstructured logs and move to structured logs and that's the end of my rant on logs. Um, okay. Catastrophic failures. Uh, so they also analyzed a special class of failures in this paper called catastrophic failures. Uh, 48 failures in the 198 were class classified as catastrophic. And, and the way they, what these mean is that basically uh, a majority of the users were prevented from normal access to the system. So this is stuff like cluster-wide outages. These are things like a hung cluster, you're totally in a deadlock state, you can't make progress, uh, or you lose data. And so these are really, really bad things that we generally never want to happen because it makes our users sad. So, I don't know. Um, but they found a lot of really interesting things about how we can start preventing these. So one was that 92% of these failures were the result of incorrect error handling of non-fatal errors. This is not like something like the disk drive. This is just like we did something wrong. 58% uh, of the faults could have been detected via a unit test. Uh, so we're going to come back to that one. And then 35% of these failures were caused by bad practices in error handling code. Uh, and, and we'll go through what some of those are because this is sort of getting to the meat of where they think you should focus your efforts. Um, what they considered a bad practice was you just like have like error and then you log it and then you just keep going. <laughs> um, I mean, at least it's in the log, right? Um, another one is that you abort the cluster on an overly general exceptions. This is like when you're like try catch all types of exceptions, all types of throwable, and then like do a thing. Uh, they found that that was generally caused problems when an, uh, an exception that wasn't fatal wasn't handled appropriately. And then the other one that's also my favorite is it just it doesn't even log. It just says like fix me or to do. But like we've all shipped code like that, right? Like. In Gears of War, there was a bug where like, or, or there actually wasn't a bug, but I was like reading through the code base while we were looking for a bug, and this wasn't the cause of the bug, but there was literally like a comment that says like, hey Joe, please fix, okay, thanks, bye. Um, <laughs> we looked at that for a while, but it wasn't actually the cause of the bug. Um, so what did they do with all of this research? They built a tool that does static analysis of Java bytecode, and they called it Aspirator. So the idea of this tool is to help inform us where we may have bugs in our code. Uh, so what Aspirator detected was, is your error handler empty? If so, like, I'm gonna probably tell you this is a bad thing. Um, is your error, error handler over catches exceptions and aborts? Um, if that happens, they're also gonna warn you. 
And then it's gonna look for things like to do or fix me in comments and also like file a bug. <laughs> so, you know, um, seems pretty simple. Uh, Asperger actually found a lot of really good, so they, ran, they then took this tool that they basically trained on like five open source projects and then ran them on nine open source Java systems that were all like distributed systems. And they found 500 new bugs and bad practices. Uh, 115 of those were false positives, they said. So like the big, tr the big trick here and where I think like Aspirator and they acknowledge could improve is like this case of false positives and like how do you understand the semantics of the system and like maybe is this okay? Um, they did file 171 bugs to these open source projects to be fixed and 143 of them were confirmed or actually fixed. So that's like progress. They're making like the open source software better. Um, and a lot of people were like, wow, this is great. Like, thanks for pointing this out. Like, blah, 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 we're very helpful. But then there were like some devs who were just like, I don't, I don't understand why I have to handle every exception. It's not like I'm getting paid to write code or anything. Um, and this is like also my favorite part of this paper, probably besides all of the awesome ammunition you have to now go like help your team test better, is because they do like the passive aggressive snarky academic thing, which we're gonna go through just because I find it hilarious. Um, so this is actually listed in the paper as like, hey, one dev felt that this was unreasonable. <laughs> or not one, some devs. And, and, and so they go on to say like, you know, it's often much harder to reason about correctness as a system's abnormal path than a normal execution path. Uh, and that's true, probably. Uh, they also go on then to sort of say that Cassandra had the lowest bug to handler block ratio found by Aspirator. And coincidentally, or, or no, it was interestingly, interestingly is my favorite word in an academic paper because it signals something like awesome or like a slam may happen really soon. Interestingly, Cassandra had the lowest rate of catastrophic failure. And then they include these, which is great because <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> and these are all things like, So like really big kudos to the authors of this paper because it's really amazing. Um, uh, so like I, I, I tend to sympathize with the authors of this paper that that comment was ridiculous. Um, anyway, moving forward, what they then go on to wrap it up and suggest is that you should use a tool like Aspirator that's capable of identifying trivial bugs. I believe it's open source, but I, I don't have the link offhand. Um, or like my actual thing that you are probably already doing and then can then uh, interpret this result instead of implementing a whole new two is use, tool is use code coverage. Code coverage is like, we could debate to death how useful it is and like 100% code coverage doesn't actually tell you anything, but what I find when I go into code bases and start looking at a team's code coverage is that their error cases are generally where they're lacking code coverage, especially in the branching. Um, and so if you're using code coverage and you see that it's fairly low and then you see that uh, it is the error cases are 100% not handled, you should probably start enforcing that or asking your team to increase code coverage. This is gonna start showing you where some of your holes in your testing is. Uh, they talk about enforcing code reviews of error handling code. They also talk about if you are doing a code review, like maybe spend more time actually on the error handling code in a distributed systems project because that's where all the bugs tend to happen. Um, we're pretty good at actually writing golden path is what they're sort of saying. And then um, high code coverage on error handling code is something that they do recommend as well. Um, so yeah, so that is uh, using simple, or simple testing can prevent catastrophic failures and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, so, uh I mean, this covers a lot of sort of the very, the easy cases, right? The things that you can find mechanically. But uh, when I think of, you know, the errors that you have in a distributed system, it's much more sort of the subtle timing cases. I think there was one of the papers on one of the Google systems where at the end of it they say, after we ran this thing for three months on 10,000 nodes, we found that once every billion iterations, something happens, these very sort of subtle bugs. So is the sense that, uh, if you sort of catch the easy things, those things are gonna pop out a little more easily, or, or does this just not even attack that level of those very sort of subtle interactive timing bugs? Yeah, so to repeat the question, it's basically about what is the factor of timing bugs in this? So they actually uh, had statistics, which I did include, because it's like a 15 minute talk, was about uh, timing bugs in the system and how I think it was like something like, uh, three quarters, about three quarters of the bugs are actually, these catastrophic failures especially, are actually n like deterministic and don't involve timing at all. And you can actually just reproduce them as long as you know the set of inputs. So while in production they man may manifest over long periods of time because of just like 
you know, the probability of getting those three events to happen, if you do them on a single system, um, it'll like go down real fast. Um, and then of the ones that are sort of timing related, it's not generally like a race timing between the events, it's just that like this event has to happen and then you wait like a deterministic amount of time and then this event happens. Um, so it's not as horrible as it may sound. Yeah, it's, it, what they sort of found, at least, was like the ordering of events is, is important. So exploring, as much as we can explore the state space, uh, the more we can explore the state space of all inputs, and while it's like about three, um, we'll, we'll have more confidence that it's doing the right thing. Yeah. Hi. Thank Hi. you. That was great. <laughs> um, I have a question unrelated to the paper, but I'd like to hear more about your opinions on logging. Uh, <laughs> and specifically, I think, um, since the paper kind of points out all of these pretty common areas where large bugs can be found. Um, I've noticed in lots of systems I've seen uh, kind of home homegrown logging helpers, um, and it seems to me that those could also introduce bugs. So I'm, I'm curious to see, or curious to hear how uh, the sort of logging patterns that you've seen in systems yeah. that are good and, and what you would recommend for logging in, in those kinds of systems. So the question's sort of around logging, less than the paper. So I, I mean, so I'm going to answer the bugs introduced by logging question first. I don't, if you're using logging software that's introducing bugs, your logging software is doing a very bad job because like, <laughs> it should be an observer of the system. And while we have like the whole observability fact happening, um, we, we want it to be as, usually the only thing it should be doing is maybe consuming some resources on your computer is the idea. Uh, and that's not that hard of a problem to solve. Like many systems do this. The biggest thing I sort of don't like is that we just sh um, send a bunch of random strings around. And strings are a human readable thing. Uh, they're not a machine readable thing. So we're still in this world of like the strings are for us, but they're not for us anymore. They're for the machines. And like machine learning and all this stuff like is not useful when it has to parse strings that like humans can understand because machines are really bad at that. Um, one of the systems I actually worked with and this is when I worked at Microsoft on Halo, is uh, when we did logging, we used this thing, uh, uh, this pattern of event sources in ETW, and you would define the metadata in code, and then um, what was actually shipping around was a GUID, and then like anything that was, like you could ship around event, it was basically this idea of event-based logging. So you could ship around information like an error message or something that was per event, so you would have that captured, but it was only shipping around the necessary data. It was never shipping around the like, this means, well, like whatever, like a fatal error occurred because X, like right? Like that was just metadata that was then stitched back together when a human actually had to look at it. And like, so it sounds like, oh, we're doing all this work, but then like, then you can start feeding the system into a lot of other interesting things that are happening. Like Peter Bayless is doing really interesting anomaly detection work at Stanford right now that I'm super stoked about. But we can't like, you can't give a machine a bunch of like strings. It doesn't understand them, right? So like we need to get to this world of like structured data and then the machines can help us more because I don't want to read log files from like a thousand machines. I don't know if you've ever had to debug a system where it's like, there's like, even like 10, I think I had to debug something with 10 and the other day and just reading unstructured log files. And it was awful, it was the worst. Uh, I was curious if the paper made any comments about uh, the languages that were used in the implementation, considering that it, it feels unfair to compare uh, bugs that appeared in a language like C to right. a language like Java that has different concurrency constructs or whatnot. I mean, so they sort of mention, so they do this weird thing where they're justifying the sample size of their study uh, at the beginning of the paper, and they're like, we have a variety of languages, and I was like, no, you have five or four things implemented in Java and like one thing implemented in C. So I think this paper is mostly probably focused on like if you're writing Java code, what can you learn from it? And I think a lot of the error handling stuff is mostly probably from the Java world of forcing you to try catch everything, and so then people like eat, swallow errors, right? Um, conversely, Go is interesting because it like makes you, um, like errors or exceptions are not thrown, but like I think there's this horrible pattern of all devs are just being like, if error does not equal null, return nil error, um, which is gonna have the same bad effect. So if you're writing Go, you're not, your problems here is not fixed. Um, so I, I think they over sort of generalize based on the fact that it's mostly Java. They do, I think Redis actually, I forget the slide, I think Redis has a lot more bugs, but I think that's unfair because it's the only one that's written in C, which is arguably harder to write a correct system in. Great. Thank you, Thank Katie. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Zeeshan, for putting this event together.